Welcome to Episode 2 of Climate, Trees, and Legacy. I'm Connie Barlow. Today is March 14th, and it's exactly a month and a half since I recorded the first episode in this Climate, Trees, and Legacy series. If you're here because Part 2 has Tory Pine in the title, then stick around, that's fine. But if you're here because you're interested in climate change and what it means for trees in the USA and Canada, forestry issues in particular, then please do go back and first watch Episode 1, An Introduction to Climate, Trees, and Legacy, also on YouTube. Now, as I mentioned in episode one, I'm doing this series because I'm a citizen advocate for what has come to be called assisted migration in a group that I started to help a very endangered conifer tree in the USA move several hundred miles north so that it would have a better opportunity to reproduce in this rapidly changing climate. Um, that was very controversial. And our group, Terea Guardians, did this action in 2008. The idea for assisted migration, that is humans intervening when plants, particularly trees, can't move fast enough on their own, meaning helped by birds and mammals if they're not wind dispersed, whatever it is that naturally would be moving their seeds. If those creatures, if those natural seed dispersers cannot keep up with climate change, then human-assisted migration will become increasingly important. And in my contention, even for common widespread trees in the decades ahead. The idea of assisted migration is not as controversial as it was in 2008, when the group I'm involved with, Terea Guardians, did a major action in moving the endangered conifer, Terea taxifolia, the Florida Terea, from northern Florida up to North Carolina. Now it is an endangered species. It's listed with the federal government as such. It actually hasn't reproduced in its native range since about the 1960s, but we did it legally. We got our seedlings from a commercial nursery and moved them on our own to North Carolina, and they're doing very well there. So this series is really exploring what overall climate change, no matter how well our country may do in reducing our carbon emissions, um, we're going to find that in the decades ahead, the forests are going to need our help because climate warming is still going to continue, including droughts. Um, that's what I'm dealing with right here in California. This episode two takes place at the beginning of what's called the Great March for Climate Action. And I'm wearing that t-shirt, the Great March for Climate Action. Uh, you can find it on climatemarch.org. Here's another example of that. And here's the back so that you can see what this is about. Marching from March 1st to November 1st, 3,000 miles, 3,000 miles from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. These are about 50 people making the whole journey and other people walking along the way. Uh, my husband, Michael Dowd, and I are speaking along the route, supporting what they're doing. And in addition to that, I'm doing this video blog ser series, getting an opportunity to take a look at one or more tree species in each of the regions we pass through and take a look at what the future may hold for it in terms of how it's going to be affected by climate change and what role humans may need to take. So just a quick summary of what uh, the main points were in the 43-minute episode of Part 1, The Introduction. What I did there primarily is introduce a new concept, a new action for those of us who are concerned about climate change, trying to reduce our own carbon footprint, but also realizing the need for systemic action of a level so big that it's society altogether, which can get us rather in despair on occasion because it seems like, what can I do? Really, what can I do to make a difference for future generations? 
So the proposed action that I launched in the introduction, part one to this series, is what I'm calling Lethal Legacy. I'm not sure how that's going to develop. I'm not sure how others may use it. But what I'm doing along the route of the climate march is taking a look at particular species that might benefit either now or in the decades ahead with citizens helping to move uh, a variety of genotypes, that is seeds drawn from a variety of individuals, help them move north along the route that they would have moved north in previous changes in climate and warming times. Many of these tree species have been around for tens of millions of years and the one I'm going to be talking about here has also been around for tens of millions of years. The genus has. And so we need to understand that the fact that warming now is happening so rapidly that we are the cause of putting carbon dioxide and potentially methane from permafrost so rapidly into the atmosphere and because many of the original dispersers of seeds, the, the birds and the mammals that would have carried large seeded plants further north and south as climate changed, are in much less populations and in some cases they are extinct. And so recognizing all these things we realize that what's going to be necessary in the Anthropocene is for we humans to get involved. And that's going to be more than just professional scientists and paid conservationists. The needs are going to be so massive that citizen naturalists are going to need to be involved and act responsibly and inform ourselves and work together and consult. My contention and certainly what I've discovered here in California the past three weeks that we've been here uh, before and now with the climate march is how essential it is to not just read scientific papers but to have real experience with the species in their habitats. What I'm also doing is taking a look at the U.S. as a whole from west to east and seeing what we can learn kind of at a gestalt level so that when we need to learn more and more about a particular species we have a broad view of the different regions, the different forestry problems and climate shifts in each region and looking at some particular plant species, some particular trees in each region state by state as we move with the climate marchers. So in setting the context for lethal legacy and why this is important, I raised three questions that I wanted to look at during the march and during the series on climate trees and legacy. The first question is just basic and that is understanding what role in general assisted migration by humans may need to play and what the controversies are in each region and by state as climate shifts more rapidly than the seeds of the trees will disperse on their own? That's a basic overall question, okay? The second question has to do with looking at the distinctions between the forests of the eastern USA and the forests of the dry mountain states in the west and extending into Canada, the provinces of the Rocky Mountain states as well. I'm more familiar with the east of uh, the tree that I've worked with and done the assisted migration for from Florida to North Carolina is of course an eastern tree species. And in the east, when we have massive die off of trees, for example, the hemlock that's being killed off by an invasive insect species, the woolly adelgid, when they're being killed off by insect species, they're not really a threat for forest fires. They're great for the woodpeckers for a while, and they fall over and then they readily rot. We get, enough, we get enough rain to be able to bring them back into the soil. But what we're seeing out west with the massive killing of pine trees and now also spruce trees with the various beetles that attack them, and, and these are native beetles. You know, they're not like a woolly adelgid back east that is an exotic species from Eurasia. No, these are natives. And they're attacking now because the trees are existing in places where the climate just isn't working for them. Too warm, and moreover than that, extended drought. And so the question, the second question, and this is going to be multiple states before I'll even begin to have an answer, is, is it possible to even begin to move species northward, take seeds and plant them northward in the forest, common species as well? 
Or if the seedlings germinate, um, will they just simply get wiped out by fires as the existing complement of genotypes of the same species and basically species that must move north where the southernmost parts of their ranges are evaporating. Finding out whether it's going to be even possible to do assisted migration or whether you just have to wait for the forest fires to rage through and then go ahead and plant. Again, we don't have that problem back east. We can engage and we are engaging in assisted migration for this one most endangered conifer tree in the world, Terea taxifolia. So that's the second question. The second question is the east-west difference in the applications of human-assisted migration for tree species that will need help during the Anthropocene warming. The third question I posed, and it'll be a major one, is what does this mean for national parks and especially wilderness areas in BLM lands or national forest lands? Officially designated wilderness areas that can't have the kinds of human manipulations that other lands can have. So for example, foresters can very easily go into non-wilderness areas in the national forests and thin the trees out. Uh, try to engage in actions that will prevent severe forest fires and potentially go in there and do some assisted migrations. It's certainly already happening in the provincial forests of Canada. But here in the United States with the wilderness areas, are these going to be areas that simply aren't going to get help and are going to really explode in fires because we can't move in there? And what does that mean in this year celebrating the 50th anniversary of passage of the Wilderness Act in the United States. So let's get started with the lessons of Torrey Pine here in California. Now as I already mentioned, the primary lesson that I've gained with my experience here in the Los Angeles area and primarily San Diego with Torrey Pine, the primary lesson I've gained is that we really do need to experience it, where it's having its problems, where it's also been planted, anything about the tree. We can't just read about it. We have to actually have that experience, which is the reason why right here, just before I started recording, I walked a hundred yards and took a video camera picture at the marina here of a beautiful Torrey pine that was planted, obviously, a number of decades ago. Here you can see it. It's got cones on it. Uh, looks very healthy right next to the marina. Now the reason I know it was planted is that Torrey pines don't occur this far north on the mainland. They are on Santa Rosa Island, uh, which is part of the Channel Islands, just off the coast here. I can actually see them from the beach that I go down to virtually every sunset. But their main population is in San Diego. This is a classic case of what should be considered an Ice Age relict habitat. That is, the tree used to occupy a much greater range, but now, for one reason or another, it's in two isolated remnants. Now the second lesson that I've learned from being with Torrey Pine and learning more about Torrey Pine is that the size of a range does not necessarily have anything to do with the immediacy of moving it with climate change. Our Torrey taxifolia, the U family conifer tree that we moved in 2008, had not only a very restricted range in northern Florida, but it had stopped reproducing a number of decades earlier. So that's obvious. Something needs to be done. No matter what the Endangered Species Act scientists were doing to try to help it in its critical habitat, its historic range in Florida, it still wasn't able to grow long enough to be able to reproduce. Something was going wrong there. Well, here in San Diego and also on the Channel Islands where there's one representative range there as well, um, it's doing fine, especially doing fine where people have planted it uh, a few miles beyond its preserve, its critical habitat. 
I have read from the scientific literature that, however, the genotypes are very limited. I mean, this is a very small range. I've also learned from the literature that the fossil evidence for this tree, its genus here on the West Coast, goes up as far as Oregon. Okay, it had a much more expansive range in the past. So again, this is a relict species, made a relict by changes in climate during the Pleistocene. So what I've also learned is that merely having a very restricted habitat size doesn't necessarily make it overwhelmingly important to start moving assisted migration for a species right away. Let's see why that is for Torrey Pine. Well, here's a video that I took in the main preserve, the nature preserve for Torrey Pine, just north of San Diego. You see that the preserve is right along the high cliffs of the ocean. And then as it moves inland, you can see the Torrey Pine. It's the only tree that you'll see there is silhouetted amongst what's otherwise chaparral and sagebrush. This Torrey Pine is remarkable. In fact, it has one of the longest root systems of any tree anywhere in the world. Uh, the record is shown to be somewhere about 230 feet laterally, and it also can go very deep as well. Now take a look at how wind-sculpted some of these trees are. In contrast, take a look at some of the footage of Torrey Pine I took where it's actually being used as a landscape tree, well watered, in this case, in the housing development where my husband's son, Shane, lives. Look at how soaring they are. And obviously, the fact that these large trees occur in very straight lines, both along the street and along the sidewalks, um, this has been planted there. This is just north of its native range. This is in Encinitas. Now I also took my camera and I walked up the hill oceanward from this development so I could look down. Here's a video of looking down at this condo development and look at the light green, the light green canopy. That's the pines. Elsewhere you'll find some eucalyptus and so forth, but those are the Torrey pines, well watered, beautiful. So the conclusion I reach is that people love Torrey pine. San Diego loves Torrey pine, and in fact, Los Angeles tries to grow it too. One of the papers I read says that Torrey pine actually grows well just about anywhere you want to plant it. Um, fossil evidence for it is in Oregon. So just because it only lives just north of San Diego and just on Santa Rosa Island in the Channel Islands doesn't mean that that's the only place it should live. Now the reason I'm not concerned about advocating assisted migration right now is primarily because San Diegoans are doing such a great job of planting it, having it seed on their own properties, on the private land. And so San Diegoans are proud of their tree. They're proud of their Torrey pine. And I kind of like the idea that it stays with them for a while. Certainly there will come a time, almost inevitably there'll come a time, when Torrey pine will need to be moved. Um, but we don't have to worry about that right now but we do for other species, and we'll explore those in the states that lie ahead of us. Oh, one thing I need to say to dispel any confusion, and it's a confusion I had for a while. When I started working with Torea taxifolia, in fact, I first advocated a system migration for it in my 2001 book, The Ghosts of Evolution. That's because I visited the reserve in the Apalachicola, and I'm very familiar with a deep time perspective. You can't understand how best to conserve a plant species unless you understand its evolutionary history, where it's been in the past, paleoecology. And so 
that's what I advocated in my 2001 book. But people started mentioning something to me about Tory pine. Tory pine. I said, no, this isn't a pine. It's a conifer, but it's a yew species. Well, it turns out that while our species is called Florida Torea, its genus name is Torea taxifolia, the California Tory pine is genus Pinus, and its species name is Toriana. So it's Pinus Toriana. So both of these trees were named for a famous botanist, John Torrey, who lived in New York City and did his work in the 1800s. Now, he never saw either of these trees in the field, but his students named these trees after him. Again, Torea taxifolia, the eastern yew family tree, and Pinus toriana here in California, the rarest pine tree in the USA. I can actually show you live here the distinctions in the needles between the two uh, and in the seeds. Let's first take a look at the needles. I've been carrying this around since November. I gathered this when I was doing an action, an assisted migration continuing for Terea taxifolia in North Carolina. This comes from uh, one of the trees that I visited that had been planted in North Carolina about 80 years ago. And this is one of the ones where we obtained seeds from legally and then continue to plant them further up the mountain slopes and northward. Here are the five-needled pine tree, Pinus toriana, uh, the California tory pine that you can see. It's got five. It's also the sturdiest of all the needle pines, very brittle. It's unlike white pine. Many of us familiar with conifers, we think five needles, oh, that makes it a white pine. No, this isn't even related to white pine, but it still has five needles. So this is the California Tory pine. Now let's take a look at the cones, or the seeds rather. First, here's a seed of Terea taxifolia. This is the assisted migration plant I work with and the reason I have them here in California is I gathered a bunch from several adult trees in North Carolina and I'm going to be doing another assisted migration in two parts of Ohio uh, coming up when the climate marchers go through there and also sending them to someone in New Hampshire and in Michigan. So we're testing out the northernmost part of the range for this, quote, Florida Tory species. Terea taxifolia, one large seed surrounded by a, a fleshy sarcotesta when it's on the tree. Now, the Tory pine has a traditional pine cone. Here's one. This is the Tory pine cone, and this one has already fallen off the tree and opened. In the literature, I've read that once it gets started growing, it takes about three years, three full years to actually grow and develop on the tree. Then it starts to open like this, and the seeds will take up to 12 years to fall out. And then, of course, the cone will, will fall to the ground as well. Uh, they do not all fall out in the first year, nor the second, nor the third. Um, it's really slow about it. Now, the interesting thing is when you look at a, what the cone looks like when it's still on the tree, I did gather one from a tree. Let me show it to you. This one here. Um, this was gathered from a tree, and it's very heavy, very, very heavy. Uh, you can see that the scales are still all together and you see the resin on here. Those of you who are familiar with the uh, the pine tree species that actually need fire to reproduce, let's say the jack pine back in the eastern USA and Michigan, certainly the lodgepole pine uh, up in the Rocky Mountain areas, the high elevations of the Rocky Mountain areas, both of those have cones that look very much like this. They stay closed and a fire actually has to come through on the ground in order for them to open. Now what's known about the Torrey pine is that the mature tree is very susceptible to fire. It'll die even if it's 
canopy needles are fine. If a fire comes through, it'll tend to die. But what it happens is that it'll open the rest of the cones and the seeds will have an opportunity to grow. So in order to get recruitment, in order to get a new generation starting to grow, pretty much need to have a ground fire come through, as is true with the lodgepole pine and the jack pine. Now, let me show you the seeds. This cone here actually had a couple seeds that I could pull out, and, and two of them fell out of it. I have a photograph, too, that I'll show you right now. It's a photograph of what the seeds look like. These are very large pine seeds. This one here still has a bit of the um, wing on it, but in general they have a very small wing. It's agreed upon. This tree does not release, some pines release, open their scales and have a big wing and a small seed and they fly off in the wind. They can disperse very well, very easily. These are very large seeds. They require birds or mammals to carry them cache them and either get killed or forget about where their cache was so that they can then go and grow. But it's not wind dispersed and again it's the species that are large seeded, uh, can't rely on the wind, that are going to need our help in the Anthropocene in keeping, keeping pace with climate change. Now I also had another seed but I already broke it and I ate it. These are called stone pine nuts because they're so hard to get into. Um, pinion pine nut, very tasty. You can, you can crash, crack right through it. You can eat it. Of course, you take off the shell too. This, your teeth can't get through. I had to use a rock and pound it on the pavement. But its seed was moist and tender and tasted just like pinion pine. It's known that the Native Americans here um, we're actually cultivating this tree, tending it, taking care of it, planting it, and certainly using its seeds. Now thus far I've shown you footage of videos I've taken of three places uh, where I've been in the presence of Torrey Pine. The first one was right here. This is along the beach in Oxnard, California, which is northwest of Los Angeles, but I showed you the footage here at the marina of this tree that was obviously planted. I also showed you the Torrey Pine in its native range in the State Preserve north of San Diego. There it's sculpted by the wind and living in a chaparral environment. And of course I showed you the soaring Torrey Pines, just beautiful, planted in the housing development in Encinitas north of San Diego. I'd like to show you one more spot because the very first place uh, where we, Michael and I were hosted when we came into Southern California was in Southeast San Diego. Longtime friend of ours, Keith Mesker and his wife Marge. And I was on the property for a couple of days before he mentioned that that big tall pine tree that was right above his house was a Torrey pine. So here's some footage of the Torrey Pine in Southeast San Diego. Now, the reason I really wanted to show you this was I was very lucky to be at his home when there was a dense fog that rolled in one night and was there in the morning. In fact, when I walked out, the fog was still there. It sounded like rain. It wasn't rain. But it sounded like rain because the Torrey Pine needles were gathering the droplets and dropping them as rain. Uh, so I got an opportunity to, to learn how fog is so important. Torrey Pine would not be able to live here in Southern California without the fog. It creates its own dewdrops, its own rain, as the redwoods are known to do as well. I walked away from the tree and I couldn't hear any rain. I did see dew forming on some of the plants. Here I'll show you a succulent that they had in their garden that had some dew drops on it. But take a look at this large, I think it's a bird of paradise, it's some tropical large leaf of a plant right underneath the Torrey Pine and look at how that leaf gathered so much of the, of the dew drops falling on it thanks to the Torrey Pine. So to sum up the lessons of Torrey Pine in California, 
one lesson is that habitat size does not really matter in this case. The fact that it's a very restricted small range uh, isn't crucial for saying, oh, we've got to start doing assisted migration right now. Now, the way that San Diegoans and Los Angeles and other people are protecting the tree, growing the tree, giving it plenty of water, um, they're doing a great job. It's still reproducing here and people are also in action in this local area. The importance that I've discovered and I've known for a long time is that experience matters. You've got to experience these trees. You've got to see it in different ways. And I might mention this is one of the things that frustrated me so much when I was dealing with professional scientists about Torea taxifolia, uh, both before and after we did our assisted migration in 2008. I had taken the time to visit four very different locations in California where the sister species of Torea taxifolia, that is the California Torea, Torea californica, actually lives in the wild. Uh, it tends to be rather rare, but where you find it, it's quite abundant. And that's another sign that its seed is not being very well distributed. But it's always in the mountains, always in the mountains in California. So with habitat change, with climate change, it can move upslope and downslope and around and into a canyon and on the north side or the south side in a way that going between Florida and across the flatlands trying to get to the southern Appalachians and back and forth and back and forth as climate changes, very difficult to do. No wonder the eastern Torreya species got stuck in Florida after the end of the ice ages. But here in California, uh, before I did the assisted migration of the Florida Torreya into the southern Appalachians, I visited Torreya californica as it is in Kings Canyon, appears in the wild in Kings Canyon National Park. I also found several of examples of it in Yosemite National Park. I uh, also went up to Napa Valley. It's got a tougher time there as the mountains are not nearly as high, and so it's pretty much getting stranded on the north side near the peaks of the mountains on the west side of Napa Valley. The final place I went was where the champion trees are, just extraordinarily huge. They're at sea level, virtually at sea level, about five miles inland north of Santa Cruz. And what keeps them going there is they are in a canyon they can be in the mountain slope or on the river valley there, but they have intense fogs that infiltrate that canyon at sea level, and therefore there's no drought stress at all for these trees. So again, I got a chance to actually witness and see and look at the sister species of a genus, the Torea, that's been around since the Jurassic, and it's a pretty good indication that the eastern species of Torea would appreciate the same kinds of opportunities to be in mountainous habitats in the southern Appalachians and points northward as well. Now by happenstance here in Southern California I've encountered three other tree species that have lessons for us in this time of climate change and I'd like to introduce those here. The first one I'd like to introduce was also at our friend Keith Mesker's home in the southeast part of San Diego. Uh, this is one that had been planted before he moved in there and it was one that I've encountered before in my travels in Florida but there in Florida, it's a nasty invasive species. It comes from Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, and in fact, it's called the Brazilian pepper tree, Shinus terebinthifolius. Now, it's a terrible invasive in Florida, but here in California, it's not on the list of noxious plants. It's on the list of exotic plants. But in recent years, we've realized that there's so much work to do in handling the exotic plants, the non-natives that take a foothold here and are able to reproduce, but to handle the ones that really are noxious, that is invasive, that is that they are taking over habitats 
away from the native plants here. It's so important to deal with those that we don't even bother with the ones that aren't noxious. And so here in California, Southern California, Brazilian pepper tree was something that I could look at and admire. In fact, my experience in San Diego was really surprising. And that's that it appeared to me that if we didn't have Brazilian pepper tree, and if we didn't have Australian eucalyptus just kind of on their own, happily reproducing, there wouldn't be very many trees at all. So that's an important lesson, that an invasive in one place may not be an invasive in another. In fact, I read that the Torrey pine here in California is being tested in New Zealand as a possible plantation tree to provide timber. I mean, isn't that amazing? a tree that's very rare here in California being tested in New Zealand. Now what surprised me is that when Michael and I drove out to Redlands, California to meet with the climate marchers on their first day off, one day a week, they have a rest day and this day they were having a rest day at a UCC church in Redlands, California that actually did a potluck for them, the members brought food, uh, allowed them to camp out in tents in their backyard. Um, it was just a wonderful time there. But when I went to get into the back of the van and open the door, I noticed something red on the back of the foot area that we stand on to get into the back part of the, of, of the van. That was Brazilian pepper tree had dropped berries onto the back of the van while we were there, and we had carried it all the way to Redlands. But had I not noticed it, potentially, potentially, I could have driven across country down into Florida and been engaged in spreading this noxious species in Florida. Now, obviously, had I just arrived in Ohio or Michigan, it wouldn't have been able to survive there. The climate is wrong. But it's just a reminder of how in these times, how easy it is even for good citizens to inadvertently spread noxious species. The second tree I want to mention is something that I got an opportunity to gather fruit from beneath while Michael and I were visiting the climate marchers in Redlands. And I guess in Redlands there are so many oranges dropping off trees that people don't bother to collect them. Well, I did. I collected them both for us and I left a canvas bag on the breakfast table of the marchers filled with oranges I had just gathered that morning. Now, what was also interesting for me is that this winter I had a chance to read a really terrific book. The book is American Canopy, and the subtitle is Trees, Forests, and the Making of a Nation by Eric Rutkow. He's still a graduate student in history, and one of the chapters in here is on oranges and how a particular woman discovered an orange tree that we now call the variety navel oranges down when she was in South America and she brought branches of it back that could then be rooted. It basically has almost no and sometimes no seeds in it. So it's propagated by cloning. It's a lot of trees are that provide fruits, notably bananas. Anyway, it was fun to have just learned how oranges came to Southern California and the role they played in the settlement of Southern California by European colonists. The third and final species of tree I experienced here in Southern California that I'd like to share with you is another specimen that was on the grounds of Keith and Marge's home in Southeast San Diego. This is Cherimoya. It's, in my view, the most magnificent fruit there is. It's tropical, it's from the Americas, it's from South America. It's Ananaceae family, genus Anona, and um, take a look at this glorious fruit. This is their tree. This is, they have one cherimoya that was growing there when they moved in, and they've since planted another one. Now, the reason that I want to talk with you about cherimoya is not just to introduce you to this most delightful fruit, but the fact that Sometimes people really have to participate in helping a tree reproduce. And so Keith Mesker is going to talk to you here about how he helps his cherimoya be able to fruit. 
So this is the uh, fruit of the Chirimoya tree, and it is, in um, my opinion, the most delicious thing that there is to eat. In order to get these, I have to pollinate the flowers because the wasp, which pollinates it in its native habitat in South America, does not live here. So I have to take a, uh, a number two artist's brush and I have to go to the, the flowers. The flowers open in a female stage and then later, maybe a day later, they open in a male stage. And when they're in the uh, male stage, then I have to go to them with a number two artist's brush and remove pollen which I'll put into a jar and then at a, another time or at the same time if there's female flowers open on the tree then I will stick it to them with the uh, artist brush dipped in the pollen and that's how I hand pollinate all of the flowers in this tree and you will on occasion find me with my feet 15 feet off of the ground risking life and limb for the benefit of this fruit. And of course I, you know, I water it and we we put our house on a gray water system and all the gray water in the whole house comes to this one tree and it's um, it's very happy and it's very productive as a result of all that. I was trying to get Keith to say he has sex with this tree, but he wasn't willing to do that. Anyway, you can see how much he loves this tree. Now I'd like to show you a little video I took of what it looks like to actually slice into and eat this spectacular fruit. All right, here's a beautiful cherimoya. Just gorgeous. It's kind of nice and squishy. Let's cut it just with a butter knife here. Mmm, perfection. All right. Gorgeous. Fruit of the gods. Look at that. Here's how the seeds look. Easy to come out, right there, beautiful custardy texture, pineapple, strawberry, banana taste. Mmm, just luscious. One other thing I'd like to mention about cherimoya, it's not just the lack of a pollinator, that is that we've moved the tree up here, but we don't have the insect that can pollinate the flower. But the tree also has lost its dispersal agent. If it were not for humans, this tree might be extinct. Ultimately, these seeds want to be deposited in some rich, fertile dung and then they'll grow and make a great tree. Let me show you a couple pictures of the animals in South America uh, that probably co-evolved with this Anona species, Cherimoya. Um, and then when they went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene, about 11,000 years ago, the tree lost its dispersal agent, but fortunately, humans were here by then, um, the first peoples, and of course, they would have carried the the fruit around from campsite to campsite and inadvertently spread it, if not intentionally planted it. So here's one of the animals. It's the giant ground sloth, endemic to South America. Some of the smaller species came north into the southwestern USA and Florida. But this species is gone. Almost certainly it would have eaten cherimoya. As well, the toxodon would have also been a co-evolved disperser of cherimoya. So again, uh, we don't have to worry about assisted migration of cherimoya. It's so tasty. We humans have been taking it as far north as it can possibly grow. Now that's good news for those of you in Oregon because 30 years from now, 
you'll probably be able to grow cherimoya there too. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about what I've experienced here in Southern California directly relating to human impacts of climate. Good news was when we were driving Interstate 10 from La Quinta westward through the pass to get to Los Angeles, we happened to be doing it on the day when the great storm was coming in. So here, take a look at what I consider to be the good news for humans, and that is that the last time I experienced this pass on Interstate 10 from Los Angeles eastward, and in this case driving westward, Yes, there were wind turbines, but there weren't this many. Look at how far California has gone in moving towards renewable sources for its electricity. Now, the wind was so strong on our van that I had a hard time keeping the camera from jumping all around. But just experience this looking first at the south side of the interstate and then directly ahead looking west and then looking to the north side of the interstate. Wind turbines galore and lots of wind, lots of wind right that day creating electricity. Now we first entered the state through Interstate 8. That's at the very, very southern part as we were heading first to San Diego before the climate march started. And on Route 8, I encountered an aqueduct. I knew nothing about it at the time, but I did take a few pictures of it. And since then, I've learned about the history of that particular aqueduct and how it serves the Imperial Valley, where a huge percentage of the winter vegetables and fruits sold in the USA fresh come from. It's that water source, and that water source comes from the Colorado River. In fact, one-third of the allotment of the Colorado River uh, goes into that area. It's for agriculture. I think the total use for non-agricultural purposes of water in California is only about 10%. And so you can see what that means. As humans start to experience the drought, what's going to happen is that the urban residents are going to demand more water and that's going to close down agriculture. Governor Brown announced earlier this year that he was going to um, not allow some of the water that would otherwise head south from the San Joaquin uh, river system and the California aqueduct system. He wasn't going to even send it to the agricultural areas today. Anyway, we can see that from not just the standpoint of trees, but also what we can learn by being in an area of how different the climate problems are in each region of the United States, and yet how deeply they're being felt. I mean, there are no climate denialists among those who are experiencing the drought here in California. They may disagree about whether humans are the cause of it, but certainly, certainly, this is a drought that isn't going away. So, final section here, and that is the visual puzzle that I announced last time. I showed you a picture of a bird in the top of a Douglas fir tree that I looked out upon while, while I was on my computer on the slope of Mount Blanca, about 8,000 feet in Colorado. Bird up there all the time, and I said, this bird is very important for the surrounding junipers. Now at that elevation, the junipers that are around are Rocky Mountain juniper, and there's a lot of them surrounding that tree. And the species is Townsend solitaire. It's remarkable, even when it was getting down below zero, that bird would simply fluff up and about every 20 minutes it would fly down to the Rocky Mountain junipers, eat some more berries, fly back up, and presumably spit out the seeds. Same family as the robins. They don't have gizzards, so they're not grinding up the seeds. They're not like turkeys and finches that grind up seeds. These are fruit eaters, absolutely essential for junipers in the past and now for dispersing. The question becomes, to what extent will we humans need to help Townsend Solitaire in moving junipers faster and farther from one generation to the next than the bird itself can do given the speed of climate change. 
And so I'd like to emphasize once again, it's not so much that climate change is happening, but the speed at which it's happening. How are these tree species going to move north fast enough and with enough of their genotypic expression to keep them healthy and vibrant as the climate shifts? That's the question. So the two homework assignments I'm going to suggest for this episode, uh, the first one is really fun. It's a five minute music video that I did about my 2001 book, The Ghosts of Evolution. I wrote the song, I'm singing it. I've also got my husband singing chorus in there as well. And remember where I talked about Toxodon and the ground sloth in South America having co-evolved with some fruits that needed them for dispersal and which now have to use humans for dispersal. Uh, you'll see that also in this music video. So just go on YouTube and Google the Ghosts of Evolution music video. A second video I'd like to suggest you watch, and this one is it's very entertaining as well, but it's very serious. I mean, you're going to learn a lot here. It's a 27-minute video put out by the U.S. Forest Service Climate Task Force. And it was intended, it was made for Forest Service and other land managers. These are professional managers of forested areas. And it's all about climate change, and in this particular video, about how the resistance of the culture to be willing to help forest trees move north may be difficult in some areas. Just put that whole thing in Google. Strategies for public land management for adaptation to climate change. It's not on YouTube. It's on the U.S. Forest Service website. And uh, the speaker there is Jill Barron. Jill Barron is an ecologist who's been on the governing board of the Ecological Society of America. And she's also been editor-in-chief of the ESA's uh, primary publication, Issues in Ecology. So that's it for Episode 2 in Climate, Trees, and Legacy. Signing off, Connie Barlow from Oxnard, California. <music>